Chapter Eight of the Palace in the Garden by Mrs. Molesworth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Stepped out of the frame, and even as one on household stairs who meets an angel unawares might hold his breath in silent awe, we stood. The unknown portrait, Sir Noel Patton. We saw very little of Grandpapa during this visit, and not as much of Mr. Truro as we would have liked, for it was some very bothering time about government things, and everybody that had to do with them was very busy. We came in to dessert, as we always did, and Grandpapa was kind in his own way. He seemed pleased that we were such good friends with Mr. Truro. I remember he said something to him about his having done already what he, Grandpapa, had not been able to do himself. Gained our hearts, or something like that, and Mr. Truro answered, "You could if you would, sir, or probably you have if you would, but think so." But Grandpapa only shook his head, though he smiled a little, in a nice way. And then they began talking again about all the papers and writings they had to do, and we got tired of sitting still and fidgeted with the wine glasses and things on the table, so that Grandpapa told us we had better go to bed. The next day, Sunday, was pouring wet. We didn't see either Grandpapa or our cousin till we were sitting in church. We had come with Nurse in the one-horse fly, which knew it always had to come for us on wet Sundays, and we didn't hear anything of the two gentlemen. We couldn't bear the long drive in the stuffy fly, and we did not like the church, for the clergyman was old and mumbled his words, and the music wasn't nice nor anything else. If we might only go to the pretty church in the village, we whispered to each other, as we whispered every Sunday. For this about the church was the thing we disliked at Rosebuds and at Ansdell. We loved going to church. It was so nice, beautiful, hummy music and lovely singing, and all so pretty. And the clergyman with a nice, clear voice and not too long sermons. And perhaps you will be shocked at this. Everybody at Ansdell knew us, and there was always a sort of rustle when we went in, and I could almost hear the schoolgirls talking in whispers about our young ladies' hats. And if we happened to see one of them, we knew and gave her a little nod and smile. She looked as proud as proud. It was just as different as could be from this ugly, stupid little church that Grandpapa had taken it into his head to make us go to here. And we were very pleased when we saw Mister Truro coming up the aisle after Grandpapa, both of them looking so nice and grand. Even though, in a way, we felt ashamed for our cousin to see what an ugly little church it was. He'll see for himself," I whispered to Tib, "and perhaps he'll say something to Grandpapa, for we were beginning to think of Mister Truro as a sort of good fairy who was to put everything right. Grandpapa and he had driven over in the dog cart, of course. They didn't mind the rain, though I'm sure we didn't mind it either, for that matter. We should only have been too happy to drive over in the dog cart under waterproofs and mackintoshes, and when we were getting into the fly after church. Gerald looked so woebegone that Mister Truro took pity on him and picked him out again. "I'll find a corner for you where you shan't get wet," he said in his nice, bright way. Lucky Gerald! We heard him chattering as he went off in Mister Truro's arms. You know it is worstest for me, isn't it? For I'm only seven, and it does make my head ache so. I suppose he had what is it you call it? Squeams of conscience. Is that the word? I must ask you. Oh, how stupid I am! That it was selfish of him to desert us. He always takes refuge in his being the youngest and only seven, as it was then, when he is afraid he is going to be blamed. But after all, it was a good deal better in the fly without him. Nurse doesn't think it rude of us to whisper when we are alone with her, so Tib and I could say anything we liked to each other all the way home without Gerald's rosy round face poking in between us every moment to say, "What did you say, Tib? I can't hear, Gussie." What we did keep saying to each other was mostly about Mister Truro. What was he going to fix we should do? Would he think it over till he found out we should tell Grandpapa at once? And if Grandpapa were worried and said in a hurry we must never go to our palace any more, how horrible it would be! 
"'I don't think he will,' said Tib. "'He's so very understanding. "'If he could only see the place himself, "'he would quite understand that we can't get any harm there "'or do any mischief.' yes i said i wish we could have shown it him besides if he's our cousin and has heard about regina's he might find out something about our princess but tib didn't care about this idea i don't want it spoilt she said i've got used to her being just our princess and to there being a mystery i don't want to undo it it didn't look very like undoing it we never saw mr truro all that afternoon and it was one of the longest i ever remember it cleared up about tea-time and we went three times round the lawn on the gravel path of course and we saw grandpapa at the drawing-room window which he had thrown open for some air as we came in and he asked us if we had seen mr truro and when we said no he turned away saying rather crossly i wish he'd be quick i'm sure it's not a very tempting day for a long walk and tib and i rather agreed with gerald that we wouldn't much care to be grandpapa's scratchetary but late that evening near bedtime it was we heard a quick step coming to the schoolroom door may i come in said mr truro's voice we all jumped up to welcome him and nurse discreetly retired i can't stay long dears he said and we are off first thing to-morrow morning but listen i don't think you need speak to your grandfather about your discovery just now wait till he comes back the next time a fortnight hence i shall come with him and he will not then be nearly so busy i've satisfied myself that you cannot come to any harm in your palace and i'm sure you will do no mischief there no and perhaps grandpapa knew of it what do you think the day he said we might go through the door in the wall if we could and he only forbade us making friends with people not with portraits said mr truro with a smile well good-bye my dear little cousins i can't tell you how pleased i am to have made friends with you he stooped and kissed us all hurriedly for we heard doors opening and a voice in the distance which we were quite sure was grandpapa's where is mr truro and then he was gone and we didn't see him again the next morning it almost seemed like a dream his having been at rosebuds at all especially when we again found ourselves in the saloon that afternoon our dear princess smiling down at us as usual you don't know princess what a nice new cousin we have got we said to her for we had got into the way of telling her everything that interested us i'm sure you'd like him and i'm sure he'd like you tib went on and we really could have fancied the sweet proud face gave a little amused smile i think he was very sorry not to come see you but perhaps he will the next time he's here then we went on with some of our usual plays and we were as happy as could be it seemed somehow a good long while since we had been in the palace though in reality it was only three days and we were tempted to stay a little later than usual but just as we were thinking we must go a rather queer thing happened you remember my telling you that the door of the saloon the real big door which must have been the regular way of coming into the room from the rest of the house if there was a house i don't think we had really ever thought seriously if there was a house or if the saloon was sort of a pavilion in a garden all by itself well this door was locked firmly locked we had tried it two or three times but it was quite fast not stuck or stiff or anything like that but quite locked but this day just as we were coming away we heard a little very little faint squeak like some one trying to open or shut a door very very softly and looking at the big heavy gilt handles it was a double door with two sets of handles and all that you understand we distinctly saw one of them turn and then all was quiet and motionless again we looked at each other and then we all darted forward i think it was rather brave of us and seized the handle it turned certainly easily enough as door handles generally do but that was all the door didn't open it was as firmly fastened as before if we hadn't all seen it said tib i should have thought it was fancy but we were satisfied that it wasn't 
whoever turned the handle must have locked the door again on the other side as quick as thought i said they must have been peeping in at us without our hearing and then when they heard the squeak the handle made as they were closing the door again they must have quietly locked it expecting us to come see who was there i wonder who it was we all wondered but in vain it may have only been the person who comes in to dust said tib there must be such a person unless the princess herself comes out of her frame in the night to do it only if it were that person most likely she'd have come in and asked us who we were and what business we had there it's very queer we decided when we went home that the next day we should make our way in as quietly as we possibly could so that if any one were there they shouldn't hear us in time to run away and we'll sit quite still all the afternoon said gerald we won't make the least bit of noise so that they'll think we're not there and then they'll come straight in they must have known we were there to-day it's not likely they'll come straight in if they don't want us to see them said tib i can't make it out whoever they are they've more right there than we have i think the only way is to take our books to-day and sit quietly reading and we had better hide ourselves as much as we can so that we shouldn't be seen all at once aren't you at all frightened said gerald suppose it was some kind of robbers nonsense said i mr truro said he was satisfied we couldn't come to any harm there i believe what he said i'm not going to be frightened are you tib no no i don't think so she replied rather doubtfully anyway i shouldn't at all like never to go there again but we all three did feel very excited the next afternoon and i think all our hearts were beating a good deal faster than usual as we noiselessly made our way out of the conservatory and along the passage now so familiar to us through the little ante-room and then as quietly as possible opened the door into the saloon and then you know i dare say big people must know all about these things better than children how very quickly thoughts or feelings or something not exactly either since i wrote that a big person has told me that the word that best says what i mean is impressions i'm not sure that it says it to me but that is perhaps because i have never thought of the word in that way before you must know how very quickly one seems to know a thing sometimes before there could have been time even to get to know it by any regular way of hearing or seeing well that was how it was with us that day the very instant the door opened we knew there was something different in the room it seemed warmer more alive there was more feeling in it and yet it was darker than we had ever seen it before at least that end of the room where our princess was had got into the shade somehow her face was not the first thing that caught our eyes as it usually was or was it her face there she stood i dare say you still think us too silly when i tell you that for about half a second we did think the princess had really stepped down out of the frame it was so like her there she stood quite still but smiling at us as if she had expected us her hair was dark like tibbs and like the pictures her eyes just the same as both of theirs but she was far far prettier than either she was dressed in something white and there was some pink about it too and though of course it wasn't really made the same way as the dress in the picture it was like enough to give a confused feeling at the first of being the same and she was standing a little in the same way and a hat a black hat with drooping feathers was hung on her arm we three just stood and gaped and stared as if our eyes would come out of our heads and she stood still smiling but perfectly motionless gerald was the first to come to his senses he ran forward a little towards the end of the room where the portrait was it was still there it was only that one of the blinds had been drawn down so as to cast it into shade and glancing up at the wall he called out it's still there isn't it it's another princess and at his words a peal of laughter not very loud but such pretty clear laughter i wish you could hear it rang through the room and the new princess the living moving princess came forward to us holding out her hands so 
"'You have come at last,' she said. "'I expected you this morning. "'I knew you heard me at the door yesterday, "'and I thought your curiosity would bring you early. "'I didn't quite like her calling us curious. "'It wasn't quite the right word to use "'for all our pretty fancies about the princess "'and even about the mystery.' "'We never can come in the morning,' I said, "'because of our lessons, and it wasn't curiosity.' "'Indeed,' she replied, a tiny little bit mockingly, "'not curiosity. "'What shall I call it, then? "'Your inquiring minds, eh?' "'I felt my face get red, "'and I felt that Tibbs was getting red, too. "'I don't know who you are,' I burst out, "'and if you don't choose to tell us, "'I'm not going to ask. "'That isn't curiosity.' "'But I wish you hadn't come. You spoilt it all. Our own princess!' And I glanced up at the portrait, looking, I could not but confess, like a washed-out doll beside the brilliant living beauty of the girl beside us. Our own princess is much nicer than you, and if we had been so curious, we might have tried to find out things in pokey ways. We've never done that. I looked, I suppose, ready to cry. The lady's face changed, and then I knew that while she had been talking in that half-teasing way, something in her voice and smile had reminded me of Grandpapa. Of Grandpapa! I mean, when he was in that sort of laughing-at-us way that we couldn't bear. Perhaps this had made us all feel more vexed at her than she really deserved us to be. But when her face changed, and a soft, sorry look came over it, she reminded me of more than any real face I had ever seen. She reminded me of all the prettiest and nicest fancies I had ever had. The sweet look in her eyes was so sweet that I wished I might put my arms round her and kiss her, and Tib told me afterwards that she had felt exactly the same. "'I'm very sorry,' she said simply. "'I didn't come here to hurt your feelings. Good fairies never do that, unless to very naughty children, whose feelings need to be hurt, and yours don't need to be hurt.' "'for I know you're not naughty children, very far from it. "'Of course, you wouldn't try to find out things in any way that wasn't nice. "'I know that, but wouldn't you like to know my name?' "'If you like to tell it,' we said, smiling up at her. "'Or would you rather count me a sort of a fairy?' she went on. "'Are you one?' said Gerald softly, "'stroking the pretty stuff of which her dress was made. "'Perhaps,' she said, smiling again, I shouldn't wonder if you could decide that better than I can. Try to find out. Think of some things I couldn't know unless I were a fairy. I know, said Gerald, our names. You couldn't know them if you weren't a fairy, or, or if perhaps you knowed some fairies who had told you them, he added, getting a little muddled. If I had a fairy godmother, for instance, who had told me them, she said. Yes, that might be it, said Gerald. "'Well, then, dear me, I mustn't make any mistake, "'or my godmother would be very angry. "'After all her teaching,' she said, "'pretending to look very trying to remember, "'like Gerald when he stops at eight times nine "'and screws up his mouth and knits his brows. "'Well, to begin with, the eldest, this is Tib, "'but her real name is Mercedes Regina. "'This is Gustafa, and this is Gerald Charles.' "'and Gustafa is generally called Gussie. "'Now, have I said my lesson rightly?' "'We all stared at her. "'You must be a fairy,' said Gerald, "'but Tib and I felt too puzzled to say anything. "'What shall we call you?' I asked. "'Anything you like. "'I've got a lot of names. "'One of them, curious to say, "'is the same as the name scribbled on the portrait "'just above the name of the painter. "'Did you ever notice it?' "'Do you mean the same name as Tib's second one?' I asked. "'Regina?' The young lady nodded her head. "'That's very funny,' we said. "'That's the name in the book in London, too.' "'What book?' she asked quickly. I hesitated a moment, then I thought, as I had said so much, it would be stupid not to explain. So I told her. She looked sad and thoughtful as she listened. "'It was scored out,' you said,' she asked. "'Yes, with a thick black stroke, as if somebody had been very angry when they did it,' I said. "'If we hadn't known the name from its being Tibbs, I don't think we could ever have made it out.' "'Ah,' said the young lady, and it sounded like a sigh. But in a moment she smiled again. "'I didn't come here to make you sad,' she said. 
won't you tell me about the games you play and let me play with you perhaps my fairy godmother has taught me some that you don't know and that you would like to learn but we didn't feel quite ready for playing games yet there were two or three things on our minds the new princess saw that we looked uncertain what is it she said you look as if you're afraid of me no said tib and no said i it isn't that but there are some things we want to ask you ask them i won't call you curious i prom but just that moment a bell rang not loudly but she heard it at once and started up she had been sitting on one of the old couches with us all about her i must go she said come to-morrow and i will tell you all i can good-bye good-bye till to-morrow and in half an instant i never saw any one move so quick she had gone we heard a key turn in the lock of the double door outside and that was all we looked at each other again without speaking surely she must be a fairy of some kind after all End of chapter eight